I wanted to go on to ask you about the two characters through whose eyes we see most of what mm. happens in the book. One is the young boy mm. who believes he's, he's eight years old. He's mm. been raised by his grandmother on the Upper East mm. Side in New York, a very, I think you described as a Victorian background. And the woman he believes is his mother, who's known as Dial mm. in the book, who, who goes with him to Australia. And you, you use their two sort of perspectives quite a lot mm. and you sort of shift in and out of those. And I wanted to ask you about how you, how you sort of orchestrated that or how you found a way to, to make, especially the young boys, sort of consciousness percep- perceptions mm. credible. I, there were a number of stages in this. The first thing that I did and in my initial desire was to write a book completely from the boy's point of view. And I think maybe there was something in that that was sort of protective of my own foreignness and not being American and not understanding things that I could take refuge in Mm. a child's perspective for time and Mm. get things wrong. And and in my mind, it was really being narrated by the grown-up man who was inhabiting his memory of what it was like to be a child. So it's quite a complicated thing to be going on. But it pushed the language in an interesting way that I really liked. And I was very, I very, I stubbornly adhered to it, and even when it was, I knew there was something not working. It didn't really start to click, to answer the first part of the, mm. the question, I think, until I knew what Dial knew, and I knew where she'd been, and I knew what her background was, but I hadn't written it. It started to get very boring, simply from not having enough information, and so I really needed Dial's perspective, and I needed Dial's life, and I needed to know the reader to know what was at risk for her and all that sort of stuff. And so when the, mo- the time when I finally gave in and began to do that, mm. uh, the book really clicked. The thing of, of actually inhabiting the boy's perspective was not really particularly difficult for me to do. After all, we are meant to do this. You know, I mean, we are meant to imagine what it is to be other. And if I'm a man, I'm meant to be able to write from the you know, as a woman. And if I'm white, I'm from being black. Many people think you shouldn't do these things, but I think this is what we mm. this is what we are. But do you but, think doing it from the perspective of a child presents particular difficulties because you've got to rein in so many things, or no, and, and, and yet be convincing? I've never been a woman, but I have been a child, <laughs> mm. and so in terms of placing yourself in the in that uh, position, well, I, 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 I didn't find it a stretch. I mean, it's like, yeah. you know, people, when I wrote True History of the Kelly Gang, people said really wasn't it terribly restrictive to be limited by Ned Kelly's vocabulary and Ned Kelly's intellectual or bookish mm. lack, of, lack, of, lack of literary education. So, well, no, because it's a very, it's a very uh, restriction, I think, that really pushes the language into interesting ways mm. and makes... And after all, when we talk about all of these things, you know, about story and character, and the, the real point of the book is that, you know, to have the reader swimming in a river of words and that, uh, that's how the words work and how mm. the words sing that really is the thing. And that's why a plot synopsis is the most stupid thing on earth because it just eliminates everything, you know, like the pleasure of reading, finding out what's going to happen next and swimming in that river of words. So the thing that was very attractive about writing from the boy's point of view is being able to push the language into somewhere new. So it's very, very attractive. Mm. And that's, I never thought about the difficulty of it. I just thought, what can I do to push and twist it? And can that make something new and interesting? The, the, The thing that is... Well, it breaks the rules, you know, it breaks the, of what you're meant to do, you know, is in terms of continually switching point of view, you know, within a chapter or within a where you have the child's point of view and the next second you find yourself in Dahl's point of view. Mm. You're not meant to really do that, I think, but people do it. I think it's a, one of the great attractions of the book, that, yeah. that, that, those transitions. And, yeah. and also one of the other linguistic pleasures for me in reading the book was your descriptions of Australian nature and the situation in which they find themselves mm. and it's very very sort of rich but very sort of compact descriptions you talk about inky green forests and banana leaves like like f- moving like fingers mm. and and afternoon slow and thick like ants and I, I wondered if that was if that was something you'd had to to work on carefully to get that to pitch it the just thi- right I think the thing that produces 
those things is firstly just emotionally a, a sort of a, a certain intensity of feeling and almost impatience and of course me- memory but I'm prepared to betray memory at any second to make something work but most particularly an increasing desire that I have to sort of get rid of everything that isn't doing something and if you get rid of you cut off the fat and so you just in the end you, you're left with the thing you want to say and then you want to nail it to the next thing you want to say and if you can do that you'll you may make something new and mm. you may make something quite beautiful and still be coherent of course and still yes. not leave the re- 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 so the, the sort of distillation or the cutting away is something I've sort of become rather obsessed with and it's a great source of pleasure too.